Uh, for me, it is an absolute honor to be able to present to you our next speaker. Her name is Dr. Liza Kerwin. She is the Director, Deputy Director of the Archives of the American Arts at the Smithsonian Institution. First educated at the John Hopkins University and then later, like myself, at the University of Maryland. She presented her paper today on, and I want to sound as European as I can, the A to Z of artist writers at the Archives of American Art. Please welcome me in joining, uh, welcoming Dr. Kerwin. I'd like to join others in thanking Yurik, Adika, and Robert for organizing this extraordinary conference and to the Terra Foundation for American Art for their support of scholarship in the history of American art around the globe. I'm delighted to be here, but I have to say was a little intimidated by the invitation. I didn't know how or what to contribute, so I decided to talk about what I know best, which is the archives of American art and the artist's writings among our collections. The Archives of American Art is part of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. We collect, preserve, and make available primary sources documenting the history of the visual arts in the United States. We seek to represent the intertwined networks of the art world, what June Wayne might call the ecology of the American art world, by collecting the papers and other primary records of artists, dealers, critics, collectors, arts organizations, and galleries. Since 2005, two major grants from the Terra Foundation have transformed the archives for the 21st century. With Terra's support for digitization, we now have 160 entire collections available online. That's more than two million digital images. Terra has put the archives on your desktops as, vir as a virtual reading room, accelerating discovery and forming a critical foundation for new methods of digital art history. The Archives of American Art holds more unpublished writings by artists than any other repository in the world. The aim of my keynote is to provide a high-level view. Uh, I could have talked about the 2,053,526 files available online, but I only have 50 minutes, so I've limited it to just 26, an A to Z outline of the many ways that artists engage with the written word with the hope of encouraging new areas of investigation and posing new questions. For a conference about words, the alphabet offered a ready framework, and hopefully you can follow along without checking the time. When I get to V, I'll be almost done. <laughs> I'm using primary sources as illustrations throughout. The words may not necessarily be readable on the screen, but if there's anything that um, you're interested in, uh, let me know and I can provide copies. A is for autobiography. Among the papers of artists at the Archives of American Art, there are thousands of autobiographical writings, ranging from brief narratives to extensive life stories, many unpublished. Many artists had truly fascinating lives, and a first-person account ensured that a record, in their own words, would remain, providing a context for the artist's work to be understood in the fullness of his or her experience. S. Fierce Labodkina is an artist who should be better known. She also believed that she should be better known and left nothing to chance with her life story. She titled her three-volume autobiography, Notes for a Biographer. <laughs> the conceit being that there would be biographies written about her and those writers would need her notes to get the story straight. And what a story it is. She was born in Russia in 1908. During the Russian Revolution of 1917, she emigrated with her family to Manchuria, where she studied art and architecture. In 1928, she moved to the United States. She studied at the National Academy of Design. There she met her future husband, Ilya Bolotowski. They were both early and active members of the American Abstract Artist Group. Her three-volume autobiography provides a detailed reminiscence of her life, career, family, and friends, lovingly assembled with copies of photographs tipped in. The books are covered in brown paper like a grocery bag adding to the homemade feel that is something like a combination photo album, scrapbook, and rare typescript. In the context of this conference, it would be, it's important to mention that Slobodkina also wrote and illustrated children's books, most notably Caps for Sale, a tale about a peddler and a band of mischievous monkeys, first published in 1938. Beloved by generations, Caps for Sale is still in print and has sold millions of copies making Esfir Slobodkina one of the most popular artist writers to have ever lived. Slobodkina was a woman of action. 
1976, she self-published her autobiography in a limited edition of 100. One could look at all of the unpublished autobiographies in the archives, the paper remnants of unfinished projects, to rediscover these artists as writers and the challenges they faced and tried to publish or even complete their life stories. B is for biography. I have to say that typically artists write about themselves, but when they do write biographies, these tend to also be about themselves. <laughs> A case in point is Nancy Douglas Bouch's biography of her father, painter George DeForest Brush, the joyous painter, a well-written and vivid account of his life, but also of hers. Nancy was a painter and theater designer and Brush's eldest daughter. She was born on the 4th of July in 1880 in Paris. Along with her siblings, Mary, Jane, Thea, Jerome, Tribby, and Georgia, she often served as a subject for her father's paintings. And that's Nancy at the uh, top of the pyramid in the photograph. He taught her how to paint. Nancy began working on the biography of her father in 1946 five years after he died, and worked away at it for more than two decades. She wrote to everyone who knew him, gathering information, piecing together her own memories, and finally publishing The Joyous Painter in 1970. Bowditch donated to the archives her draft writings, but also all of her correspondence with friends and acquaintances concerning the biography, along with the Brush family letters and photographs. The biography of George DeForest Brush is intertwined with the lives of his family and close friends, the papers re reveal not only his daughter's search for herself, but tangential information about Brush's circle, including his neighbors, painter Abbott Henderson Thayer, and author Mark Twain, and others. C is for children's literature. S. Fierce Labodkina and Charles Green Shaw were both members of the abstract artist group. They both wrote and illustrated children's books. They had the same editor, Margaret Weiss Brown, who would author Goodnight Moon and The Runaway Bunny, and the same publisher, William R. Scott and Company. But they came from different worlds. Born into wealth, Shaw moved easily in the moneyed class of New York's social elite. He began his, his creative career as a writer. In the 1920s, he spent time in London and Paris and wrote personality profiles for The New Yorker, Smart Set, Vanity Fair, and Town and Country. He wrote hundreds of magazine articles, several books, a play that had a short run in New York, and later, reams of poetry, mostly short poems, many experimental, unrhymed. By his count, he published more than 3,500 poems. Between 1938 and 1948, he wrote about 20 children's books. It Looked Like Spilt Milk is his best known. Originally published in 1947, it's still in print today. The illustrations are a series of bimorphic white shapes against a blue background. The reader is asked to guess what the shape is or whether it's just spilt milk. Shaw used simple sentences and even simpler pictures, blobs resembling a rabbit, a pig, a birthday cake, a tree, a squirrel, a mitten, a great horned owl, in a game that compels young readers to use their imaginations. A con the concept is fitting for an abstract artist whose wood relief paintings looked a little like spilt milk in 3D. If the underlying premise of spilt milk, encouraging children to recognize figures in abstract forms, conflicted with Shaw's passion for non-objective painting, he was untroubled by it. In an interview for the archives in 1968, when asked about the interchange between his writings and his paintings, Shaw flatly replied that there was no connection. He saw them as two entirely different aspects. Writing was a thing apart, not to be confused with his paintings. Of all his creative works in any media, Spilt Milk reached the widest audience and continues to delight readers today who are still looking for the squirrel or the pig in the white blob. D is for diaries. For the historian, a good diary is the next best thing to being there. Fresh, intimate, and direct, diaries are more reliable than memoirs, that are written long after the de events described and less constrained by the conventions of letter writing. There are thousands of diaries in the archives. And while many are fairly dull, Charles Green Shaw, for instance, kept a daily record of his exercise routine, there are exceptions. <laughs> One of the best belonged to an obscure second generation Hudson River School painter named Jervis McEntee. McEntee is all but forgotten today, but at the end of the 19th century, he was at the center of the New York art world. He lived in the 10th Street Studio Building and was a member of the Century Club 
and the National Academy of Design. In the 1890s, this was the American art establishment, composed of the old guard fighting a defensive and ultimately futile battle against the encroachment of European influences. McEntee's diary is an insider's account of the battle. He knew every artist of note in the city, and best of all, he was an incurable name dropper. <laughs> McEntee's diaries are available online with complete, fully searchable transcriptions. In this flexible form, one could use digital tools to mine the text for the frequency of words or phrases in context, or to map McEntee's social networks. At the Smithsonian, we now have an online platform called the Transcription Center, where we upload digitized documents for the crowd to transcribe. And miraculously, there are people all over the globe, from New Zealand to Newfoundland, who are transcribing our handwritten historical documents into searchable text. And it's about 90% accurate transcriptions. E is for eulogy, death. It's perhaps the only certainty in life. For those experiencing the death of a friend, loved one, or admired figure, words are often inadequate to give voice to the intense emotions involved. Yet the archives holds countless examples of people attempting to respond in words. This is Romare Bearden's eulogy for his friend Carl Holty. Holty, who was a bit older, introduced Bearden to the idea of abstract painting. They both showed at the Coots Gallery, and in 1969, they co-authored the book The Painter's Mind, a study of the relations of structure and space in painting. In this eulogy, Bearden wrote, and I quote, he once told me that a true artist should never have any fear of death because it comes as a repose after a life of the hardest and most frustrating kind of labor. The death of an artist evokes powerful emotions in the living, even as it crystallizes the deceased's contributions to the art world. F could be for fiction, but that's too easy. F is for fragment. <laughs> what is an archive but fragments? There are no complete records. All we have are bits and pieces, and if we're lucky, we have lots of bits and pieces substantiated by other evidence. And that's what keeps researchers coming back to the archives. The whole story has never been told. It's never complete, and always changing with the situation of the interpreter. I'm showing you a fragment from the papers of painter Henry Oswa Tanner. Deeply frustrated by racism in America, Tanner, who was of English, African, and American Indian descent, moved to Paris in 1891 and remained there for the rest of his life. As an, as an expatriate, he not only found a receptive social climate in France, but won critical acclaim for his poignant paintings of biblical themes. Among Tanner's notes is this fragment of his earliest recollections. It begins with a story about his mother being removed from a streetcar because of the color of her skin. Tanner wrote over a page of his figure studies. He literally entwines his life story with his art. And this is to say that it's amazing what writings you can find in folders marked miscellany in the archives. It's often the stuff that defies easy categorization that yields the greatest reward. G is for grant application. This is a form of writing that you might not think of, but a grant application can be an extraordinary find. A grant application gives you solid biographical details um, and the artist's written proposal for what he or she hopes to accomplish. And while it may not happen as planned, the grant application fixes desire. It is the desire to be funded, for sure, but also the desire to create something. The application provides a rare statement of intent. I'm showing you John Bernard Flanagan's application for a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1940. By all accounts, Flanagan had a tragic life. His father died when he was very young. He was separated from his mother and placed in an orphanage. He had a life of poverty, alcoholism, depression, broken relationships, and debilitating physical injuries. Though he began as a painter, he found his calling in stone and direct carving. He had an intuitive feel for freeing the image from the rock. In 1932, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship to carve stone in Ireland and his sleeping cat pictured here is one of his works from that period. But in 1939, he was hit by a car and subsequently endured four major brain operations. His grave condition following the accident depleted all of his resources, but he also had to abandon stone cutting. He just wasn't physically able to do it anymore. It was hoped that a second Guggenheim Fellowship would support a new direction. In 1940, he applied to, and I quote, 
write and publish a definitive and articulate statement, a well-defined philosophical approach to working in the graphic arts and to work in casting metals and ceramics. He did not receive a second Guggenheim. Two years later, destitute and debilitated, he committed suicide on January 6, 1942. Later that year, Dorothy Miller organized a memorial retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. The 1940 grant application outlined a new direction. It's unlikely that a second fellowship would have turned his life around. Failed grant applications are the history of things that didn't happen. H is for handwriting. My colleague Mary Savick recently organized an exhibition called The Art of Handwriting, where she asked leading authorities to look at an artist's handwriting and consider if or how it relates to their art. She began with the premise that every handwritten message conveys the sensibility of the writer at the moment of interplay between hand, eye, mind, pen, and paper. And one of the letters in that exhibition was Georgia O'Keeffe's to Katie Wells, 1939. She asked Sarah Greenow, senior curator of photographs at the National Gallery of Art, to comment. And she wrote, and I quote, Georgia O'Keeffe's letters, like her paintings, have their own idiosyncratic style. She never used commas, rarely employed periods, and instead preferred squiggly lines of varying length that seemed to mimic the way she spoke or thought. But her penmanship is always bold and confident, befitting an artist who had carved a path for herself at a time when there were few other women painters to provide ready models." End quote. Through a close reading of handwriting, the distinctive marks made by artists would spark new ways of understanding the visual through the verbal. And Princeton Architectural Press will be publishing The Art of Handwriting as a book in 2016. In her groundbreaking article, Ad Reinhardt, painter as writer, Adika Freelich looks at not only the content of Reinhardt's writing, but how he put words on a page <coughs> to expose a deeper layer of meaning that is his signature style and a significant expansion to the history of art. For many artists, words were not enough. They added drawings, caricatures, watercolors, and collage. In a letter to her parents, Mimi Gross colorfully combines the verbal and visual to describe a market day at Novi Pazar, a town in southwest Serbia. She writes, and I quote, thousands of farmers are here with horses and wooden saddles and sheep, chickens, goats, carts, bags, baskets, rugs, woolen suits, skull caps, cloths around heads, raggedy scrawny kids, patched up old men, toothless braided humpback eight meter wide pantaloons, embroidery threads, cow and sheep cheese, three meter high ice cream cones in a row, hot, hot sun and skies, end quote. She and her then husband, red groom, sat sipping lemonade and Turkish coffee under an umbrella, taking in the scene. They also explored medieval monasteries. Travel tends to sharpen our observations and to heighten our awareness of the extraordinary qualities of everyday life. This illustrated letter, like Mimi Gross's paintings and 3D constructions, captures the lively spectacle of street life. In the letter, the street scene is on the diagonal, dynamically leading the reader into the activity with a vibrant rhythm of color and striking spots of red. The energetic triad of red, blue, and yellow makes it seem as if everything is happening all at once. The present of the street scene and the past of the Byzantine fresco is happening at the same time, and indeed Mimi drew inspiration from the past for her art in the present. Illustrated letters have the power to transport us to another place and time to recreate the sights and sounds. They also reveal countless clues about the varied artistic temperaments of the authors. J is for journal. There's a significant difference between a journal and a diary, though the words are often used interchangeably. A diary is more of a chronicle of events in real time. Where did you go? What did you do? And so on. A journal, on the other hand, is more about personal reflection. Who are you, what you feel, and how you can improve your life. In the past year, we've been focusing on collecting the papers of women artists who were active in the feminist art movement between about 1960 and 1980. And uh, one of the interesting things about these kinds of collecting initiatives is that we see things that we didn't notice before. And one is that all of these women kept dream journals. This was an era of selfish, of 
conscious of self consciousness excuse me this is an era of consciousness raising groups transcendental meditation women's liberation and personal empowerment and do it yourself dream analysis became an exercise in self awareness this is mary frank's dream journal from the 1970s for artists dreams are often a source of inspiration artists have explored the relationship between images produced in dreams and their waking life and creative expression and that was the case with mary frank in her dream journal a few weeks ago we held a panel in new york about the feminist art movement and I mentioned this um, uh, phenomenon of the recurring dream journal. Uh, Joan Semmel, who was on the panel and still a fierce feminist at age 82, asked the packed audience of women, where did all our dreams go? K is a hard one. I went with Kina because it was on my mind. John, <laughs> John Hell Jr. is a writer and performance artist and an active participant in the male art phenomenon also known as postal art or correspondence art. It's a populist art form where artists use the postal system to circulate small scale works, capitalizing on rubber stamps, collage, really anything that can be put in an envelope and stamped and sent via post. Held as a champion of mail art, and his international mail art network is well documented in his voluminous papers at the archives. This keynote, which traces the development of mail art from Duchamp through Ray Johnson, is a rallying cry for this truly democratic art form that encourages cooperation rather than competition. All are invited, all are accepted. For L, I thought of letters, of course, or lyrics. Thomas Hart Benton wrote lyrics, or lectures. We have the typescripts of Frank Stella's lectures that he delivered at Harvard University in the early 1980s, but I'm partial to lists. The Archives of American Art counts hundreds of thousands of lists in its, its collections including to-do lists, membership lists, lists of paintings sold, lists of books to read, lists of appointments, lists of supplies to get, places to see, lists of people who are in. The form is ubiquitous. Whether dashed off as a quick reminder or carefully constructed as a comprehensive inventory, lists give insight into the list maker's personal habits and enrich our understanding of individual biographies. They may reveal the process by which decisions are made or show the distillation, distillation of an argument into its essential points. Every exhibition generates a list or multiple lists. Many are historically important, throwing a flood of light on a moment, movement, or event. In 1912, American painter Wal Kuhn asked Picasso to recommend European artists for the 1913 Armory Show. And this uh, list is Picasso's recommendations, including Marcel Duchamp, name spelled out phonetically, whose ned nude descending a staircase caused an uproar at the exhibition. There's also Leger and... Um, Agree, among others, uh, but what's most curious is that Brock, Picasso's uh, uh, frequent collaborator, seems to have been added as an afterthought in pencil at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Though it doesn't look like much, this list reveals the behind-the-scenes organizations of a, organization of a landmark exhibition. M is for manifesto. Of all the manifestos in the archives of American art, this is the most vile. Valerie Solano's Manifesto for the Society to Cut Up Men, or SCUM. Solano, a radical feminist, is known for two things, this manifesto and her attempted murder of Andy Warhol. In the spring of 1968, she purchased a gun, went to Warhol's factory, and shot at him three times, the first two missing him, the final shot wounding him. Solano turned herself into the police. She was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and pleaded guilty to reckless assault with an intent to harm. She served a three-year prison sentence, after her release, she continued to promote her SCUM manifesto. She had a following. This copy of SCUM is among the papers of artist Nancy Sparrow. And is for novel. Born into immense wealth, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney was a sculptor, art patron, and founder of the Whitney Museum of American Art. But what you might not know is that she was also a writer. As early as age 10, she turned to writing as a creative pursuit. If you read her early journals, you will find a young girl who is desperate to be loved for herself and not her wealth. I have to say, it's often hard to identify with her misery. In January 1896, she wrote, <laughs> quote, riches make for more unhappiness than all the poverty in the world. This was just eight months before she wed Harry Payne Whitney, whose family was almost as rich and socially prominent as the Vanderbilts. They were married at the Vanderbilt Summer Cottage, the Breakers, in Newport, Rhode Island. 
Women of Gertrude, Gertrude's stature, the cultural elite, were both consumers and producers of the literary arts. This is a draft of one of her unpublished novels, Through a, Dark, Through a Glass Darkly, from 1902. Gertrude had an extraordinary life, and she was a serious sculptor, but almost everything you read about her would lead you to believe that once she took up sculpture, she abandoned her writing, but that's not the case. She wrote several novels, one of which, Walking the Dusk, was published under the pseudonym L.J. Webb in 1932. She wrote numerous plays and short stories. In, early, in the early 1940s, she took a professional writing class at Columbia University, and then there are her journals and autobiographical writings. If one looks at the breadth of her papers, it's clear that writing was a constant creative outlet, one that she pursued from her childhood until her death. And it was her principal creative activity in the last years of her life. How many other American artists are novelists at heart? O is for opinion. In 1932, the same year that Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney published her novel, she also introduced the Whitney Annual Exhibition, which would become the Whitney Biennial. The Whitney Biennial is considered one of the top trend-setting or trend-defining exhibitions in the United States. It's also the exhibition that everyone loves to hate. And I'm showing you Oscar Blumner's open letter and private opinion of the very first Whitney Annual in 1932. He declared it a flop and laid the blame squarely on the participating artist who sent, in his estimation, mediocre derivative work. Blumner was a bold experimenter with color and form. He had a painting in the exhibition, but for him the only bright spot in what he called the 157-piece mess was Georgia O'Keeffe's abstract portrait of Alfred Stieglitz and several other artists who weren't terrible. Blumner made 50 copies of his private opinion. He gave eight to the press, 30 to painters, and 12 to collectors. It was partially published in the magazine Creative Art in March 1933. At the archives, there are countless examples of artists who, in the grand spirit of American free speech, express their negative opinions of art institutions, the government, other artists, the Whitney Biennial, etc. What motivates an artist to take a stand in writing and in print? And what are the social and professional consequences? P is for poetry. In 1979, Robert Smithson's widow, Nancy Holt, published the writings of Robert Smithson. In 1986, she donated the bulk of his papers and her own papers to the archives. And it didn't take long for the world to discover that the collection contained unpublished writings, including 22 handwritten poems from around 1959 to 1960. They were all written in black ink on the same size paper, as if for presentation, but according to Holt, Smithson had no plans to publish them. Smithson's art, and if you really think about it, there's not a lot of it, and his plentiful writings, both published and unpublished, have spawned an art historical industry. There have been about 10 dissertations on Smithson in the last decade, not to mention articles, books, new anthologies, symposia, and other productions. In fact, it's rare not to have someone in our reading room working on Smithson. <laughs> to the to the Man of Ashes is one of these early poems. Smithson was 19 or 20 when he wrote this, and it is a punch in the gut. This poem begins with nothing and ends with nothing, like a burial rite, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Smithson was reading T.S. Eliot, and there are echoes of the wasteland, and partic particularly Eliot's chilling line from the burial of the dead, quote, I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Smithson scholars have made much of the connections between his writings and other poets, even bringing William Carlos Williams into the mix, who was, oddly enough, Smithson's pediatrician. For the young Smithson, our inheritance is the desolate earth, dim, parched, barren, burnt, dusty, blasted, empty. He could be describing one of his future earthworks. And indeed, Smithson said that his writings and his art were in dialogue, in an interview for the Archives Oral History Program in 1972, when asked about his early writings, Smithson noted, and I quote, well, it comes out of my sensibility. I mean, it comes out of my own observation. I mean, it sort of parallels my actual art involvement. In other words, the two coincide. One informs the other. 
That was a very crucial time. It was in the 50s, and everything was repressed and stupid. There was no art context as we know it now, end quote. Through words, Smithson created his own context. This poem is an earthwork of sorts in words and an anti-prayer of compounded nothingness. There is no eternal life, only the bleak here and now in the vast expanse of geological time. And with that, I invite you to take a seat in our manuscript reading room with the other Smithson scholars who are producing some of the most intriguing art historical writings of our time. Q is for questionnaire. Like grant applications, questionnaires can be a gold mine for researchers. In the late 1960s, in preparation for his book, Federal Support of the Visual Arts, art historian Francis V. O'Connor sent questionnaires to artists who had participated in the New Deal art programs. And while the artists then in, their late th then in the late 1960s had to recall events from 30 years earlier, their answers continue to be useful to historians today. Many of the artists provided lengthy and poignant replies. Sculptor Eugenie Gershoy, for instance, wrote, and I quote, the federal art project literally opened up a world of new opportunity. It was possible to experiment without restriction and to have one's work seen, appreciated, and used. There was a sense of a relation to a public, and very important, a stimulating, invigorating feeling among artists that made those years a glorious, thrilling experience. With collections like O'Connor's, one also has the obvious advantage of exploring how artists working in different media and geographic locations responded to the same questions. R is for reviews. Fairfield Porter is best remembered as a painter, but he was also one of the most articulate critics of his generation. Porter's writings and correspondence provide a detailed chronicle of his life in the American art world from his undergraduate days at Harvard to the year of his death in 1975. His papers, which are all available online, include his notes and some of his draft reviews, including the one shown here for a de Kooning exhibition at the Martha Jackson Gallery in 1955. It was Elaine de Kooning, Willem's wife, who got Porter his first job as an art critic. She had been a reviewer for Art News, and when she left the magazine, she recommended Porter as her replacement, and he jumped at the chance because he always thought he'd be good at it, in fact, better than anybody else. In an interview for the archives, Porter explained, quote, the reason I was good was that I would try as much as possible when looking at something that I had to review to cease to exist myself and simply identify with this so that I could say something about it. But that wasn't simply my own idea. I learned that because I was told to do that, not in so many words, by my editors, end quote. They gave him a year at Art News, and he stayed for seven, and later wrote for The Nation. For Porter, the best criticism was accurate description, but his writings are far from that. In this brief review, Porter connects de Kooning to Delacroix and Ang, and, re re and diffuses complaints that de Kooning's women are monstrous by comparing two women in the country to a garden of tulips. Porter ends, I quote, here is that shock or surprise that is so often the sign of original creation, end quote. For Porter, the writing renewed his painting, not just the writing, but looking at things. He would think about something that he was writing about and think about why the artist was doing something or other, and then he would look at his own painting and question what he was doing and if he could do it differently. It would be worthwhile looking at Porter's paintings from the 1950s in relation to the reviews he wrote to discern the cross-pollinization of ideas his, from his writings to his art. S is for statement. In a nutshell, an artist's statement is a brief paragraph meant to inform an audience and elicit a deeper appreciation and understanding of a body of work. Today's MFA programs teach students how to write an effective artist statement. There are books and blogs devoted to the topic, workshops, websites, services for hire, seminars on YouTube, and even a pretty hilarious online artist statement generator where you can generate your own artist statement for free. If you don't like it, click a button and generate another one. <laughs> we may think of the artist statement as a phenomenon of the 1980s when understaffed galleries made the artist responsible for text. But the form has been around for as long as artists have been explaining themselves. Jackson Pollock was not known for his writing. He barely wrote anything. But what is remarkable is that this artist statement exists among his papers, and I was glad to see that Philip Lipinski quoted it yesterday in his talk. 
According to Helen Harrison, who is the director of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center, this statement is exceedingly rare and for Pollock, curiously poetic. It reads, technique is the result of need, new needs demand new techniques, total control, denial of the accident, states of order, organic intensity, energy and motion made visible, memories arrested in space, human needs and motives, acceptance, Jackson Pollock. He wrote this meditation on his aims on good deckle edge paper and signed it as if for display, but no one knows why or how it got pasted to a photograph by Hans Namath. We think it was written in 1950. That's the date of the painting behind Jackson. The catalogue raisonne puts it at around 1950 because that is when Hans Namath had filmed Pollock painting and Pollock was asked to supply a narration. However, this text was not used in the film. The statement could be seen as a written intervention of sorts. In 1950, Pollock was getting a lot of attention. That year, there was an article about him in The New Yorker, and the year earlier, there was an article about him in Life magazine that was still in the air. People were focusing so much attention on Pollock's technique of poured paint that his intention was getting lost. This statement addresses what his paintings are about, not how they are done. It's not about any specific painting, but it makes the case for content rather than form. Pollock's wife, Lee Krasner, was deeply involved in shaping his public pronouncements and written statements. And because of Lee's close involvement, it's impossible to know if part or all of the statement was suggested or supplied by her. There are thousands of artist statements in the archives of American art, and often multiple statements from the same artist, because an artist statement is a living document that should change as the work develops. Most artists have to write them. Most artists hate writing them. The artist statement has become part biography, part self-mythology, part experimentation or intervention. One could look at statements from artists over several decades. What changes? What remains the same? If he was going to be testimonial or tribute, but then I remembered this rare treatise by Stanton MacDonald Wright. MacDonald Wright, along with Morgan Russell, created synchronism, a style of painting based on pure spectral color known as chromatic abstraction. In 1924, MacDonald Wright codified his beliefs in his treatise on color. He self-published the volume in an edition of only 60 copies, which he sold to his students. Each one was accompanied by hand-painted color wheels and templates. And this is the archives copy um, from the McDonald Wright papers. We have some of the color wheels, but not all. Though the word treatise has a scientific air, this is McDonald Wright's assessment of the emotional meaning of color. It's an emotional treatise. For example, he writes about the yellow-orange scale, and I quote, Yellow-orange has also a braggart tendency, but at bottom it is weak and sickly. It is like the last pretenses dying in a pompous soul. On this account, it has a quasi-sad note, like an old man who feels senility to be not far off." End quote. You may never see yellow-orange the same way again. In a letter to Alfred Stieglitz in 1924, MacDonald Wright described his treatise as, quote, an instrument for the sensitive artist to use, not a theory or system to make colorists of boneheads, end quote. But with only 60 copies in circulation among his students, it didn't have much of an influence in its day. And soon after it was published, MacDonald Wright moved away from re reliance on color scales toward an immersion, a deeper immersion, in Eastern philosophy. Now, this is not a form of writing, but I couldn't help myself. It's such a great example for you. Bud Hopkins was an accomplished painter and sculptor known for his hard-edge abstraction. His work is in the permanent collection of the Whitney Museum, the Metropolitan, the Museum of Modern Art, the British Museum, and elsewhere. He was also one of the foremost authorities on UFO sightings and the phenomenon of alien abduction. Missing Time is, as promised on the cover, the book that started it all with startling revelations about alien-human contact. In Missing Time, Hopkins tells the story of people who have been temporarily abducted by aliens and taken aboard UFOs. They had missing time. That is, they had no memory of the events, but under hypnosis, many abductees recalled in vivid detail the harrowing experiments that left mysterious scars on their bodies, the eerie interiors of UFOs where they were held captive, and the astonishing faces of their alien hosts. 
This is my personal copy of Misting Time that I read in the 1980s, because who wouldn't want to know the shocking truth? <laughs> also shocking is that the archives actually had the original typescript for Missing Time among the papers of Bud Hopkins. In the introduction to Missing Time, Hopkins admits that being an artist gave him a certain freedom to introduce such peculiar topics at cocktail parties in Provincetown. <laughs> it also gave him the latitude to write four best-selling books about it. There was Missing Time, then Intruders, The Incredible Visitations at Copley Woods, 1987, which topped the New York Times bestseller list and was made into a CBS television miniseries, Witness, the true story of the Brooklyn Bridge UFO abductions, 1996. <laughs> Sight Unseen, Science, UFO, Invisibility, and Transgenic Beings, 2003. And his final book, Art, Life, and UFOs, which was published in 2009, knits together his life as an artist and as a UFO researcher. In 1991, he said, and I quote, I had come to understand that an abstract painting at its most powerful was a kind of aesthetic scrim behind which lurks a concealed obsessive thing or image of some kind, transformed, made palpable by the artist's mediating skills, end quote. One could say the same about his books on alien abduction. This is also not a form of writing, but it's an idea that I want to pass on because I've always thought that somebody should write a book about what's written on the backs of photographs. There's an image on the front, but then your assumptions could be completely overturned by turning it over the way you see a photograph is changed by the words on the back. This is a snapshot of Fritz Dreisbach, an important catalyst in the American studio glass movement. The image alone tells a story, but on the verso, Dreisbach wrote a note to Fran Merritt, who was the director of the Haystack School of Mountain Crafts in Deer Isle, Maine, about how he got to blow glass at a workshop in the summer of 1971. That workshop was the beginning of the Pilchuck Glass School, founded by artist Dale Chaholi and patrons Anne and John Hallberg in Stanwood, Washington, near Seattle. Chaholi modeled Pilchuk after Haystack. The interconnections between Dreisbach, Chaholi, Fran Merritt, Haystack, and the beginnings of Pilchuk are bound up in this one annotated snapshot, with Dreisbach saying, quote, I'll think, uh, I think I'll be doing it again next summer. W is for war correspondent. Francis Davis Millet, for a time, excelled at two careers, as a journalist and a painter. While today we might think of his genre paintings of Dutch domestic scenes as competent but uninspired, architect Charles McKim pronounced Millet the finest American muralist of his time. And editor and novelist William Dean Howells was so impressed with his literary abilities that he urged him to abandon painting and concentrate on writing. Like Robert Henry, Millet favored the American pronunciation of his name. He was a drummer boy in the Civil War, graduate of Harvard, art student at Antwerp, secretary of the Massachusetts Commission to the Vienna Exposition, a founder of the American Federation of the Arts, an executive officer of the American Academy in Rome, a trustee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, commissioner general of the United States to the Tokyo Exposition, vice chairman of the National Fine Arts Commission, and a painter. He was also a war correspondent for the New York Herald and the London Daily News during the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78. And he was decorated for his bravery under fire and services to the wounded. Among his papers are his sketchbooks with scenes of war, his memoirs of this experience, and a typescript of a lecture he gave in 1904 about war correspondence as a new branch of journalism. Millet excelled at genre painting. As one of his biographers noted, quote, his heart was always in costume and history. As a journalist and a painter, he told stories with a flair for historical events. Millet went down with the Titanic in 1912. He was last seen helping some women into a lifeboat and waving them off. X again is a hard one. But in the late 1960s, when photocopy machines appeared, artists rushed to experiment with a new media. Foremost among them was Esther Nesbitt, in 1970, she contacted the Xerox Corporation about creating experimental art using Xerox machines in their New York office. During Nesbitt's time at Xerox, she experimented with many different copying machines, materials, and techniques to create what came to be known as xeriographic artworks. And this is one of her notebooks from her experiments with Xerox. 
There are hundreds of thousands of pages of artists' notes, notes on their experiments, ideas, materials, plans, and studies that attempt again and again to capture in words their process. These notes are purely the practical need to remember, a photocopy, if you will, of the mind at a moment. Why is for yearbook? This is William T. Wiley's high school yearbook from 1954 from Richland, Washington. In 1954, Wiley was a, sen a senior and editor of his high school yearbook. The teacher most involved with the yearbook was James McGrath, Wiley's art teacher. McGrath had a profound effect on Wiley, and to this day, they have a close relationship. And I, I don't know if there's an equivalent in Europe, but in the US, high schools produce yearbooks each year, and they all have the same sort of template with photographs of all the teachers followed by photographs of the students divided by year, and then there are other um, clubs, sports, events, and other activities. And at the end of the year, the book comes out and it's passed around to friends who write their personal notes, shared memories, and teenage goodbyes. It's a ritual of letting go of high school attachments and um, looking forward to the open possibilities of the future. I met James McGrath in 2009 when he traveled with Wiley to DC for Wiley's retrospective exhibition at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Subsequently, he sent me this yearbook, and that's a page from the yearbook on the left, uh, along with other papers documenting his tender relationship with his student over five decades. And um, in this yearbook, Wiley wrote with uninhibited sweetness, Mr. McGrath, Mr. Underlined, with a sun beaming next to the salutation, quote, to you, the round rock, smooth and round, you laid the base of this which I have helped, and I'm so glad. I see the clear blue ring eyes of you laughing and crying on the pages, and I laugh and cry too. But my feet and head are high because I've left something of myself. Wiley has always charted his own course, his own journey in the art world, and he credits his high school teacher with helping him find his way. In an interview for the archives conducted in 1997, Wiley mentions James McGrath, his high school art teacher, 23 times. What impressed the impressionable Wiley was that McGrath's approach was very inclusive. As Wiley said, quote, there just wasn't anything ruled out as a potential art, voice, or poetry, dance, music, More, end quote. Moreover, he credit, credited McGrath with instilling in him spiritual values and a connection to the land. As a graduation gift, McGrath gave Wiley a sketchbook and urged him to draw and write. And according to Wiley, that was when writing and narrative structure became a real component in his art. Z is for zine. The art course holds lots of zines. We just didn't catalog them as zines because we aren't hip enough to use the word. <laughs> you can find them among printed material, but they're all over the place. A uh, zine is short for fanzine. They're typically a cheaply made, cheaply priced publication, often in black and white, often produced as a photocopy and bound with staples. Most zines revolve around a music scene of some sort, but others are dedicated to art, poetry, or cartoons, or short stories. Uh, this is issue number one of The Infiltrator. The Infiltrator, if not the first, is one of the first new wave and punk zines in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, it was in circulation from 1978 to 1981, and the infiltrator covered hundreds of local and international bands. A zine is an underground communication for a particular tribe. It's the material evidence of a community of interest, and this particular zine shows the interconnectedness among artists and musicians in D.C. in the late 1970s, and that's an interior shot from the magazine with a... Um, appropriate for this conference, a band called the Urban Verbs that included musicians and painters. So that's the last letter, and uh, I have a few last words in my last minutes. Um, on a certain level, we could all go mad thinking about the verbal and the visual. Yesterday, Yurik elegantly alluded to the instability of the word poetry. We believe that words are more certain, concrete, and fixed than the visual as a form of expression, but writing can be as ambiguous. Words are unstable, meaning shift. Our enterprise is to recover meaning as it was written and to make it relevant in the present. And uh, we hope that the Archives of American Art provides a context for doing that. And in this conference, 
the interplay of the visual and the verbal, verbal charts a new and seemingly limitless area of study. Thank you. Dr. Kerwin, thank you. I wonder if we might at this time open up the floor for questions for you. Then I have one. Okay. Is there, at the archives, is there sort of a cult object that some people come just to look at? Like, what would be the Jim Morrison grave um, of the Archives of American well, Art? Re uh, recently, it is, uh, I think we call it, I think it's Box 51 of the Leo Castelli Gallery, and those are the records for Jasper Johns. Box 51. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's a 350 box collection. It's a huge collection, but... That one box is on and off the shelf all the time, and it's because it's Jasper Johns. Yes. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I was just wondering, and you know, excuse my naive question, but um, I was wondering whether there is any period of time that is really well covered by the archives and the opposite, mm -hmm. the yes. other one that, you know, there are not too many materials. We have material going back to, I mean, the earliest things are the late 18th century. It picks up around the mid 19th century, and then we have a good concentration of late 19th century and turn of the century. Early modernism is very well documented. The WPA era, there's nothing comparable to the depth of resources in that field. The 1950s, New York particularly, we have very good strength in. California Bay Area, um, you know, there's pockets of great uh, resources. The, we are collecting now with a focus on the feminist art movement, but it's just kind of a uh, something to give us a little direction. We, we collect broadly all the time, but among our collectors, we're, we're looking at, at uh, the women who are now in their 80s and 90s, who are active in 1960 and uh, significant to the movement. But we do have more papers of women artists than any other institution, so it's really building on strength. Um, I would say weaker after the 1980s, certainly, where archives look back, and we tend to look back 50 years, and that that's kind of our collecting sweet spot, so to speak. And so now going back to the 60s through the 80s is where we're, we're focusing with a collecting project around feminism and also one to um, collect around the Leo Castelli Gallery records as a, as a focal point. Of course, I was overwhelmed that you had my letter. <laughs> <laughs> but I, the town that's in that letter, Novi Posar, the monastery that is in that town was bombed was. and destroyed. And the letter was from 1968, mm -hmm. so since mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Liza, can you tell us uh, how uh, the collections are acquired? Are there any policies, are there any sources and ways of acquiring uh, mm -hmm. materials for the collection? We acquire collections through donation, and many things are offered to us, but we also pursue uh, gifts of papers to the archives. We have people, we have an office in New York City. It's one of our most uh, active collecting areas, and we have a person in the office in New York that just covers basically Manhattan, and then we have a collector in Washington that covers the rest of the United States, <laughs> and uh, a representative in uh, Los Angeles who covers California, and then another person who sort of does south of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, we used to have regional centers around the com country, and some of you might remember those, where we had offices at the De Young, in the Huntington, uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts, where the archives was founded, New York, Boston, and Washington. But we've since uh, restructured, 
and um, it's based out of Washington with this a satellite office in New York. Um, so we, we have special collecting projects around particular themes that we think are particularly uh, filling a gap for us and of importance where if we weren't to act or to collect as a community that we might lose some really significant resources. But we're also reacting to a lot of collections that are offered to us. Um, so that's you know, basically two different ways. I have a related question. There was a time when artists who wanted to be remembered and uh, represented in art history would very self-consciously mm -hmm. write um, and then hope that the archives collected their work. And in recent years, now you, you're competing with private museums, the Getty, others to collect these papers who are willing to pay as mm -hmm. opposed to um, receive them as donations. Could you talk <laughs> a little bit about what that means for this overarching goal of representing the history of American artists' words and work and mm -hmm. whether there are plans at the archives, maybe with the help of organizations like the Terra, to um, address that? Yes, there are many fine institutions around the country that have important collections. They're all very different contexts from the Archives of American Art. And um, some do purchase. We never have. We devote all of our resources to the stewardship of the collection, making it available, offering free access, and um, providing detailed finding aids to the collections online and, and things like that. So um, I, I don't think of these institutions as in competition with us. Um, we have a very rich context in which someone's life can be seen and where connections are revealed that might not would might not be as visible in other institutions and so you know we talk to a lot of people who are trying to make decisions end of life decisions about their papers or where they want to place things and uh, you know we just talk to them about what it is we do um, our real culture of access at the archives and how those collections fit in with other things that we have so that it is um, a benefit to scholars to have materials that are so, that are separate but, but interrelated. Actually, I think you just answered my question, but I'll ask it anyway. Is all that material, all these tons of papers under A to Z, digitally available? No, they're not. Uh, we have about 20 million items and about 10% of our entire holdings are available online. So it's about two million, a little more than two million online. But our um, efforts moving forward is to digitize as much as we can of the collection. And that's why it's wonderful to have this opportunity to talk with scholars, especially in Europe, to understand the direction of your research and the needs that you have in Poland and elsewhere to understand uh, better how we shape priorities for digitization in the future. So I open up any kind of um, dialogue that you may want to have with me ongoing about this digitization program and what you think would be of greatest benefit to your work. Uh, and, um, we have been talking um, a few times now about what to do with, with um, maybe material that is not on, on, on the, in the US and on the, mm -hmm. on the ground and uh, how we could actually help getting those materials also connected to the archives that mm -hmm. you you have. And we haven't found a solution, I think, because uh, many of the institutions here, they don't want to let go of their materials. And I c think that's that's fair. It's it's probably the best way to go. But maybe for for people uh, the, in the audience who, who have kind of a stake in, in, in local archives, it would be wonderful if we could kind of create some, wor some, some type of linking Mm -hmm. um, so that the, the materials would stay here, but maybe th through digitalization or through a kind of work collaboration with you, they would be accessible and it would all become part of a... Mm -hmm. This is a, a follow-up to Heinz's question, actually. Before digitalization, as you mentioned, there was microfilm. What proportion of the collection was microfilm? 
Much less. Mm. Uh, uh, and we are now trying to develop uh, a strategy for dealing with that legacy microfilm as to how we handle that. Because we used to borrow collections and microfilm them as well as take donations. And some of the collections are part lo hybrid loan gift. And uh, you know, we would, on, uh, there's some times when we just think, well, we'll just digitize the entire microfilm collection. And that would just put everything, and you know, no one would have to use the microfilm. They could have ready access to it online. But it creates other problems for us. So um, we are um, going back to a lot of the lenders who previously had things microfilmed to try to make collections whole. Then those collections would be reprocessed and digitized. And that would be the ultimate goal of what to do with the microfilm. Thank you. But it was never the case that everything was available on microfilm. Um, I guess one of my concerns would be if you're um, obviously kind of looking back um, to do things in like a 50 year period, what we will be doing 50 years uh, from here to think about the things that obviously aren't perhaps going to be accessible like email or those things that are on the internet and obviously mm -hmm. that's a really huge question mm -hmm. um, for you to deal with but well, what's happening on yes that it's not only our problem but a problem for archives all over the world how to deal with born digital communications and we actually are taking we have been taking for many years digital files um, Bernard Sean was the first person to give me a hard drive because she had all of her emails there and we took the hard drive and put it in a box and years later we have recovered that material and it's on a server and uh, it is a problem of, um, not a problem, but we are developing protocols for sustaining the integrity of that material and also um, having to reformat it you know, you know what, what format it, it rests in so that it is most available. But we are all moving in that direction. May I suggest if you want to ask Dr. Kerwin a question later, you buy her a drink and do so? That sounds uh, like a great idea. And we can move on. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm delighted to present our next speaker, Dr. Susan Greenberg-Fisher. She finished her PhD at Yale University, where she later taught and served as the Horace W. Goldsmith Curator at the Yale University Art Gallery. Dr. Greenberg Fisher is currently the Executive Director of the Renee and Chaim Gross Foundation. Her talk today is entitled, The Head and the Hand, American Sculptors as Authors. And she will examine the post-war writings of Chaim Gross, William Zorak, and Jacques Lipschitz. Please aid me in welcoming Dr. Greenberg Fisher. Thank you, Brian, and I just wanted to say a quick thank you to our hosts um, for their incredible hospitality. Um, it's really, I'm really so grateful that I was invited to this conference, so thank you, and to the Terra Foundation as well. Um, and as Brian mentioned, um, I'm the director of the Reunionheim Gross Foundation, which is the historic home and sculpture studio of modern American sculptor Heim Gross in New York City. This is where Chaim Gross lived and worked during his later career, from 1963 when he bought the four-story building in Greenwich Village to when he died in 1991. With its tools and materials, sculpture right before you, and many sketches covering the walls, the studio is a very dynamic space. It prompts many questions from our public about modern American sculpture and particularly about the process of direct carving. Direct carving was Haim's method of making sculpture. He carved directly into the wood with handheld tools, as opposed to the more traditional process of modeling works and casting them in bronze. He was a leader in the revival of direct carving in American art in the 1920s and 30s, a process that came to represent the modern approach to sculpture. We've long consulted this book that I'm showing you here about Heim's technique, 
to get facts and information about the process of direct carving. The book demonstrates how he makes a sculpture from start to finish. It also has a bit about his own life story, growing up in the Carpathian Mountains as the son of a timber merchant in the years before World War I, of emigrating to New York City as a teenager in 1921, and of continuing his art artistic training, begun in art academies in Vienna and Budapest at the Educational Alliance on the Lower East Side. And here I'm just showing you a close-up of the sculpture that Gross creates over the sequence of pages in the book. Uh, the wood is lignum vitae wood, and this is the kind of thing I would look up in the techniques of wood sculpture, not knowing what lignum vitae was. And just so you know, it means um, wood of life, and it comes mainly from South America, and it's the hardest wood in the world. Gross's book, Technique of Wood Sculpture, is in fact one of thousands of publications that formed his library which was and still is on the third floor of his historic home, so two floors above the studio that I just showed you. It is also where you can still see his large private art collection of works by his contemporaries, an international network of artists including Kuniyoshi, Guglielmi, Orozco, Chagall, who you, can, you might be able to recognize there right in the middle, uh, Leger also on view here um, above the Chagall, and hundreds of other artists. And this is only one corner of an entire townhouse floor installed um, with this collection. It was through Haim's own library that I became familiar with a body of writing that included books like his techniques of wood sculpture. These are books that he owned, written by American sculptors about sculpture, some of whom he knew and some that he didn't. I came to learn that Hyam's own techniques of wood sculpture, published in 1957, comes at the end of a group of technical books by other sculptors, written in the years around World War II. Hyam Gross's book is a window onto these books, and for today I have chosen key examples by three artists out of a larger body of examples in order to lay out some key concepts that unify these books, and in order to make both the publications and the authors who wrote them more visible. I will state at the outset that what is significant about these writings is that, in the most ambitious cases, the books blur genres so that what begins as a technical manual crosses over into autobiography and art history. In this way, they are more than they appear, and I feel they can function as a gateway into what is still an understudied area of American art. One of the earliest books in the group, actively used, as you can see, with the ripping and the cover, is Techniques of Sculpture by Girolamo Piccoli and Ruth Green Harris, an art critic of the time. Piccoli was a New York-based sculptor, but it's more significant to us today because of his role as head of the sculpture division of the New York City Federal Art Project, which was one of the visual arts programs of the WPA, or Works Progress Administration. The WPA, which has been mentioned um, several times at this conference, uh, was the American New Deal agency that employed millions of American men on public works projects during the Great Depression from roughly 1935 until its dissolution in 1943. Across America, the Federal Art Project hired hundreds of artists to create thousands of paintings, murals, and sculptures. Chaim Gross himself had three major sculpture commissions for government buildings from 1936 to 1939 in both Washington, D.C. and Pennsylvania, which helped, him, which helped bring him both national recognition and financial support. Pico Lee and Harris's book is a very straightforward how-to book with clear instructions about how to get started as a sculptor and the steps involved in the stages of making a work. It is the preface, however, that spells out for us today that the WPA was a key context for the emergence of the technical manuals. The preface states that Piccoli and Harris wrote the book in response to a demand, a demand from the public to know more about how art is made. They write how the WPA art projects have created what they call a great conversation between the artist and public. They continue, and I quote, 
not only the artist is trying to reach out to the public, the public is trying to reach out to the artist, trying to learn to read the artist's message and so learn to need the artist's product, end quote. The public is a new great patron that the artist, quote, has not known for centuries. And you can see here, featured in the chapter on carving, um, the carving process is Chaim Gross's own ballerina. Gross created ballerina in a public demonstration three years before in 1939 at the American Art Today building at the New York World's Fair. Over the course of several weeks, the public visiting the World's Fair could watch as the large dancer slowly emerged from a block of wood. They could see and understand Gross's materials, his tools, and his technique, and they could ask him questions about his decisions as the work progressed. Piccoli's use of Chaim's ballerina reinforces the idea that the book was the text version of a public demonstration. And here I'm showing you um, just a brilliantly staged photograph um, on the left by the great photojournalist Elliot Ellisoffen of another sculpture by Gross at the same World's Fair, just to give you a sense of these large um, public sculptures that were highly visible at the fairs uh, and also commissioned for government buildings across America. And there's his 16-foot um, his, uh, sculpture then installed in front of the France Overseas Building at the fair. The public demand to know more about the process of, of the sculptor was likewise one key factor behind another technical book from the period, the sculptor Malvina Hoffman's 1939 Sculpture Inside and Out, which Haim also had in his library. But while Piccoli most likely was known chiefly among artists, Hoffman was by 1939 an internationally acclaimed sculptor and also already a best-selling author. Her sculpture Inside and Out, coming in at over 300 pages, is bursting with photographs and texts and far exceeds the genre of a technical guide that it appears to be and spills into autobiography and art history. Hoffman's life as an artist is fascinating and the key details of her biography to highlight today are her study with Rodin in Paris from 1910 to 1914 and her place in Paris within an international circle that included Russian ballerina Anna Pavlova, who Hoffman featured in her earliest acclaimed work in the 1910s and 20s. But Hoffman gained international acclaim as a sculptor and writer in the five or so years before Sculpture Inside and Out through a major installation commissioned by the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago called the Hall of the Races of Mankind. It was a group of over 100 sculptures in bronze and stone, and not plaster, which is pretty incredible. Uh, some full figures, some portraits, which showcased figures from different populations around the world. The Races of Man was commissioned in 1929 and a key attraction at the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. In 1936, Hoffman published a behind the scenes chronicle of her research, travels, and work and work in the studio that went, that went into the races of man. It was called Heads and Tails and is an incredibly complex publication and I refer you to the excellent article, a very recent article from 2013 on the book by Rebecca Peabody at the Getty Research Institute which um, houses the Hoffman papers. For now I will note that Heads and Tails became a non-fiction bestseller going through multiple editions for several decades after. And here I'm showing you on the right um, Hoffman's spectacular Martinique woman, which dates from just before the Field um, Museum Commission. So this was a kind of work that got the Field Museum's attention. Um, this work is currently on view at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, and it's, it's increasingly being used as a subject um, for contemporary artist blogs and installations, um, artist curated installations, um, particularly projects engaging critical race art history. Hoffman wrote her sculpture Inside and Out three years later, following the immense success of Heads and Tails, when she was flooded by requests from hundreds of students and artists who asked her to write a general guide about the making of sculpture. 
Sculpture Inside and Out covers everything that a student would need to know about becoming a sculptor, from anatomy, which I show you here, to setting up a studio of their own, and she included a photograph, her own photograph of her own studio. Uh, and then there are, of course, extremely detailed chapters on carving, and here she kind of humorously carves the title of the book to show various approaches to stone carving. Um, to extremely detailed instructions on um, techniques of sculpture, and here this is a diagram about pointing or enlarging a sculpture from a small model to a larger piece. The book became the definitive book on teaching sculpture, and apparently Sculpture Inside and Out was used for a long time after as a college textbook. But of particular interest today is Hoffman's engagement in her book with the sculpture of her time, within her broader discussions of what she calls the fundamental principles of art. Through beautifully curated juxtapositions of modern art, she helps the student grasp the visual language of sculpture. So here, for example, through Broncusi and Mestrovic, we grasp both the absence and presence of surface texture. And Hoffman fully grasped and even explained in a separate chapter how the medium of photography could change the form and meaning of, sculpt of sculpture. And here I'm showing you um, a second photograph by Broncusi that she included of his own work. Here Hoffman juxtaposes the work of two great modern sculptors, Jacques Lipschitz and Hanna Orloff, to demonstrate the principles of form and proportion that transcend opposing schools of figuration and abstraction. Or finally here we grasp, or we can grasp immediately, the powerful language of the body that transcends the artist's nationalities and their subjects to communicate powerfully and directly to the viewer. In a third and final example, Malvina Hoffman's ambitious book appears to have been emulated in a publication coming out just after World War II, William Zorak's Zorak Explains Sculpture. Yes, there are two Zoraks in there, both as the book's author and in the book's title. This reiteration points to Zorak's assertion of himself more, more than Hoffman, whose link to Rodin and a long tradition of academic sculpture perhaps placed her on firmer ground than Zorak. Zorak had spent the last two decades promoting and defending American artists and modern art. Zorak, though understudied and not well known today, was an artistic leader from his early career onward. The key, de the key details of his biography are his emigration from Lithuania to New York City when he was four, his training in Cleveland, New York, and Paris, first as a painter, and his instrumental role with his wife, Marguerite Zorak, also a painter, in bringing French modernism to the United States at the time of the Armory Show, where they both exhibited. However, he switched to sculpture around 1922 and became a chief proponent of direct carving, which you see on display here in this really great photograph by Charles Scheeler. Especially during the 1930s, Zorak was a central figure in, promotion, in the promotion of modern sculpture in America as a writer, teacher, and organizer. He taught for over three decades at the Art Students League from 1929 to 1960, and he also wrote art reviews and technical essays on various aspects of making sculpture in the Amer published in the American Magazine of Art. He also supported younger sculptors like Chaim Gross, as in this preface um, for Chaim's first solo show in New York. And um, it's a great third paragraph where he's both supporting Chaim, um, but also advocating for, this, um, for direct carving and sculpture. And he says, he writes, Chaim Gross has the qualities of real sculpture. He has an inherent and natural feeling for carving directly into his material, which releases the possibilities of individual expression as no amount of modeling can. And here I'm, I'm showing you just this great photograph of Zorak with Gross and also Helen Keller um, at the first exhibit of the Sculptors Guild in New York City, an artist group which uh, Zorak helped found that organized exhibitions for contemporary sculptors to show their work. And the guild still exists and supports sculptors today. So when Zorak published Zorak Explains Sculpture in 1947, he was 60 and at the height of his fame with major commissions under his belt. 
not only during the WPA era, but also private commissions, including his Spirit of the Dance, commissioned by the Rockefeller family for Radio City Music Hall in Midtown. Publishing his book in 1947, Zorak was aware of the new currents in post-war painting and sculpture. And at the very end of his book, he added a short section on welding as creative art. This final chapter ends with a reproduction of this sculpture by David Smith, who was a generation younger than Zorak. With Zorak's book, we witness how one chapter in American sculpture ends and another begins as direct carving with its monolithic form an emphasis on tactility over opticality gives way to welding with its open form, like drawing in space, and its preference for abstraction. These terms would become central in the, deb in the debates on post-war art among art critics in the mid-1950s, particularly in the writing of Clement Greenberg and Herbert Reed. But Zorak's book was written in the shadow of World War II, and above all, he encourages support and recognition of living artists in America and their integration into American life. He encourages on the broadest level, and I quote, a consciousness of world art from an art point of view and not from an historical point of view. He is ahistorical, and his instruction in the book about form, design, anatomy, carving, and casting often diverges into surveys and juxtapositions of global art throughout the ages. He is a great supporter of the sculpture of his time, whether it be abstract or figurative. He asserts their key role their key role in, the rediscovery, in rediscovering the fundamentals of sculpture, as he, as he writes, and the inner life of the object after a centuries, what he feels is a centuries-long superficiality in sculpture that began around the Renaissance and culminated in the 18th and 19th centuries. And here I'm just showing you another um, couple pages from the book of, of some other contemporaries of Zorax, including Jose de Creft, um, who also practiced direct carving. Uh, Jose de Creft on the left, and John Flanagan, who um, Liza spoke of in her talk um, on the right. And Chaim Gross, interestingly, came to own this piece on the right, which is currently um, on view at the foundation. Zorak brings in, into his book dozens of modern artists as examples, and there's no monographic treatment of any single individual. It is notable that for Zorak, a reigning international post-war figure like Henry Moore, being celebrated precisely at this moment at his first MoMA retrospective, is here just one of many brilliant artists in Zorak's mind. In Zorak's book, Moore is part of what we could call a textual camaraderie among artists, one that embodies the idea of the artist's network, rather than a curator's monographic retrospective. I will only briefly mention um, that Zorak's um, ahistorical position contrasts to the new histories of sculpture just coming out in America um, after the war. And here I'm showing you one example, also from Heim's library, uh, the 1946 Origins of Modern Sculpture by art historian Wilhelm Valentiner, um, who was the longtime director well, he had many positions, but he um, was the longtime director of the Detroit Institute of Arts. Valentiner's book, as the title announces, is in search of origins, which do not really interest Zorak. And Valentiner, in fact, encourages living artists in America to rethink and repair their relationship specifically to sculpture of the High Renaissance and Baroque, so rejected by Zorak. This position is made clear in the link um, of Brown Cousy and medieval sculpture on the book's cover. And just to give you a sense of Valentiner's book here, Calder um, is linked to medieval Renaissance and Baroque sculpture on the, um, on the right side. All with the desire for modern, a modern sculpture and painting that focuses on rebirth and regeneration after the destruction of war. Here the spread of kind of themes of rebirth um, in the upper right in the work of John Flanagan, again, uh, Brancusi. Um, he really um, favored Calder's work. He thought it was the kind of the idea of growth and the, a tree and growth in his work. Um, and then on the left, the work of Mark Toby called World Egg and Morris Graves' um, Time of Change. So there's kind of a, a unity and theme amongst these works and, and formal characteristics. 
and just to emphasize that Valentino was particularly, um, he particularly found in the sculpture of now largely forgotten sculptor John Flanagan, um, what he was looking for after the war with um, Flanagan's emphasis on this idea of the birth of form or forms just barely emerging from the block of stone. But Zorak, by contrast, is against origins and linear narrative. Rather, for him, there are no ends or beginnings, but instead a network of relationships between art and artists, unified by a fundament, the, the fundamental language of sculpture that transcend time and geography. So to return to Haim's own book, where we started, it was published in 1957, 10 years after Zorak, and it thus comes at, a, at what appears to be the end of a larger group of books that came out of the WPA era. It's a straightforward account of how to make sculpture, permeated by an artist's intimacy with materials and the love of the craft behind his art. And this contrast to these sort of photographic portfolios that were being produced around the time um, that are kind of full of inaccuracies, uh, very staged and full of inaccuracies about process. I um, mean, here you can see Haim carving while a nude model lingers in the background. He would have never carved with a nude model standing there. For one, it's kind of dangerous with all the wood flying around. <laughs> but um, he would have drawn the model. Um, so this is just kind of a, a staging. And then you, I just showed the, the photograph of David Smith where the same models recycled. Um, they didn't even bother to change her dress. They just sort of pushed her into the next photo. Um, so this is completely staged. T Hyam's technique of wood sculpture was supposed to include um, a lengthy history on wood sculpture from antiquity to the present written by Abe Chanin, who was a lecturer at the Museum of Modern Art. In the final version, this text was cut out. The book was, in the end, streamlined not the oversized, genre-blurring book of Hoffman and Zorak, but a return to the technique book by Piccoli that I started with. The view is close up on materials and technique. The book's intimacy and honesty, which has continued to appeal to contemporary artists working in wood, such as Martin Purrier and Tom Doyle, is greatly enhanced by the sequential photographs used to show the steps in the making of a wood carving. These sensitive, powerful photographs, one of which I'm showing you on the right, which was then reprinted on another page of the book, are by the photojournalist Elliot L. Soffin, who I mentioned earlier. Significantly, these books date from around 19, these photographs date from around 1938, though the, bush, the book was published 20 years later. Taken together, these sculptors' writing extend a generosity to their reader. They eschew categories and theory and have a deep respect for their fellow living artists. They extend themselves to us today and, off and offer a new perspective on an understudied and rich period of American art. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, I wonder if we might have questions from our audience at this time. I have a question for Susan. Um, is the Gross Library um, cataloged? Yes, and, and it is, but it's the um, it's not online or accessible in that way. But it, it has been cataloged, which is how I knew. I think we have we cataloged sixteen hundred books, and but that doesn't really include the really small exhibition catalogs of every you know probably about five hundred exhibition brochures of shows from the 1930s until the 1990s exhibitions in New York, but it's not online yet. And, and is this library only an art library? No, the subjects range um, everything that he was interested in. So the bulk of it um, is art books, uh, ranging from monographs to histories of Western sculpture, um, a very large portion of it is um, on African art. He was one of the foremost African art collectors in America. So there's a very large library on African art. But then also on um, Jewish studies, there's a large section on, um, by Jewish writers, um, many of whom he knew. Um, we were going to set up a rare book area for the inscribed books by all these authors that he knew. And then I realized that would be the whole library that would be in the rare book section. So we didn't end up doing that. Um, so there is a very um, wide range uh, 
Jewish topics, history, um, pre right, books on, he had also has, um, we still have his pre-Columbian art collection, so there are a lot of books on the history and context of those objects. So it's, it's pretty far ranging. But, it, but it's all a working library or also includes more personal novels and things like that? It, ha it includes um, novels, it includes the books of poetry that Rini Gross's wife was reading in the 30s. Uh, so it's, um, it's a mix. It's a real mix of, of personal and professional. So there are personal interests and then there are artistic interests, which, which blurred. I mean, everything really in the, uh, in the house um, blurs together. And I think that's, that blurring of categories is, is something that interests me in a lot of different respects now, and hence my interest in these, these books that blur categories about um, technique, and it just kind of is reflected in the, in the, the building itself. a how-to book, but is there a film of him working through these techniques? So we also have two movies that were made um, of Haim at work and uh, by the Hollywood um, filmmaker Louis Jacobs. So one is from the 30s and one is from the 50s. So they actually interestingly reflect the kind of two eras I was juxtaposing in the talk. Um, and the one, and they really shed, one is called From Tree Trunk to Head. So it's sort of the filmic version of the book. And it's literally him making um, a sculpture from how it begins as um, a tree trunk into a portrait of his wife. But it's much more than that. Um, the one from the 30s is really beautifully made film. It's made by a filmmaker. Um, it's silent. It, and it's a real, it's not only a, a good movie, but it's, a really valuable document because it takes place in his studio, um, his downtown Manhattan studio, so you get a real sense of what an artist studio was like in the late 30s. And then the movie from the 50s came out right around the time of this book um, that I was speaking of in 56. Um, but the, the later movie um, is less about the straightforward process of how something is made and it's more impressionistic. Um, it has jazz, um, a jazz soundtrack by um, Teo Macero. Is that his name, Teo Macero? Um, uh, who was a well-known jazz musician at the time. I mean, people know, people know who he was. So it's kind of more of just sort of a tonal film about him. Like Louis Jacobs. Louis Jacobs. Well yes. Yeah, well, both of them are by Louis Jacobs, which is interesting that he returned back to do a second film about him. Um, for Susan, um, do you have any sense of the influence of any of these manuals in terms of um, young sculptors reading them and maybe becoming attracted to techniques which weren't so current but were being written about and finding these things attractive? And actually, just as a kind of a, an aside, um, I was wondering if you'd noticed anything about the use of photography as well, because I'm quite interested in how sculptors often kind of a very interested in how their works are reproduced and lots of sculptors take their own photographs. I was wondering if you had anything to say about that as well. Sure, um, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, that's a key question is who read them, how, you know, what was the distribution of these books, who was reading them, how influential were they, and that's something that um, uh, they were intended, I think, for a broad public. Um, and I think, I don't really know, uh, how many you know people at the time were reading them? But I, um, I have heard that some of the contempt and I mentioned Tom Doyle and um, Martin Purrier, who are both contemporary sculptors. Who apparently, um, this is before I was at the foundation when they visited the foundation. They they specifically mentioned this book, which is interesting that it influenced them, um, and they kind of vividly remembered it. The book was reprinted in 1970. I believe, so they may have read that copy. Um, so as far as artists remembering, I think it may, did make an impact. Um, I also mentioned that um, last year, Red Grooms um, painted a portrait of Haim for something that we were organizing. And 
he told me he did it from memory, and the scene that he painted was of the sculpture from this book in the studio, and it literally looks just like the, the photographs from this book. So I do think it, it was a very memorable publication and useful. Um, someone mentioned to me that Dwayne Hansen had, uh, oh, that, that um, Dwayne Hansen had either mentioned it or that it, it, it he, um, and then photography is very key. Um, and uh, we have probably about 2,000 photographs at the foundation. And um, there are many, many sequences, these, these sort of photo narratives of the sculptor at work. So this was not the only case of him being photographed at work. And so uh, I do think that the motivation was educational, that he did want, and that was the role of the films as well. He did circulate with the films and gave lectures on how sculpture was made. So it does come out of this kind of WPA era, desire to educate the public. Uh, so we have um, photographic series of him making works by other photographers. Um, we have photographs of his sculpture that started out as documents, but because they were shot by now famous photographers who were just starting out, like Soichi Tsunami, who was a photographer from MoMA, now they have this sort of blurred status as document and art object. Uh, and then the El Safin photos that were used, you know, El Safin was just featured in a show at the Museum for African Art in Washington, D.C., and so we have tons of El Safin photos that are now works of art in and of themselves. And then also Malvina Hoffman had a whole um, chapter about how sculptors should be very sensitive to how their work is photographed. And they should do it themselves and not have someone else do it. Did that answer? I think. Okay.